My name is Ebony Love. Today's date is November 8th, 2019. I'm currently sitting in the law offices of McIlwain Martinez Dukes and Hall, located at 108 East Central Boulevard, Orlando, Florida, 32801. I'm here with Mr. Wilbert Van Cole. Can you please spell your name? Sure. It's Wilbert, W-I-L-B-E-R-T, Van Cole, V as in Victor, A-N-C-O-L. Okay, so I like to start this off a little interesting. Okay. Can you tell me your earliest memory? My earliest memory ever, my earliest memory ever must have been about four or five because I was still in Haiti and I had to, there was an entrance exam to get into one of their Catholic schools and I have this vague recollection of sitting down for like this oral exam to try to get into school. So that must have been either pre-K or kindergarten. That's my earliest memory. It's not concrete, but that's the first thing I can recall. Okay, so that means you were born in Haiti? I was not born in Haiti. I was actually born in Chicago, but I moved to Haiti at about six months, and I stayed there till about six years of age when I moved to Miami. Okay, and what year were you born? 1982. Okay, so you started in Chicago, went to Haiti, yeah. and then went to Miami. Yep. So if you had to pick one city to say that you grew up in that city, where would you say? Miami. Okay. When you came up through the Miami school system, how was going to school in Miami? Was it? I I liked it. Uh, uh, I went to elementary, middle school, and high school all in Miami. Basically all with, like I lived in the same house since I was six. So it's the same feeder pattern for the entire school system I went through. I, I liked it. I liked my experience there. I learned English through the Miami-Dade school system. So I didn't have any complaints. Like I think you have the same sort of issues you have in any school. Uh, middle school was a gigantic pain just because it's middle school, like lots of fights, lots of issues, but I didn't have any of those issues in elementary or high school, so. Did you grow up in predominantly black neighborhoods or was it kind of mixed? I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. I was uh, some combination of three non-Jewish families in the house over the like 12 years I was in on the block over the 12 years I was there. Like at most, I think we had two non-Jewish families, but it's just the neighborhood I grew up in. So when you went to school, did your school uh, composition demographics match your neighborhood? It did not, uh, because most of the since most of the people in my neighborhood are Orthodox Jewish, uh, they didn't go to public school. They a lot of them went, went to. Um, I guess there are a couple of Jewish schools around the neighborhood that those kids went to. Uh, my elementary school is fairly diverse. Um, just a good mix and I think at, at that age you just don't appreciate it's not something you pay attention to as much it's just you are who you are there middle school was almost was predominantly black um, and then high school was a really good mix high school was probably the best representation of the community as as a whole mm -hmm. amongst all of them my high school really changed after the year I graduated because there was another high school that opened up my sophomore junior year and some of the lines got gerrymandered a little bit. So the composition of my high school changed significantly after I graduated. And what high school did you attend? North Miami Beach Senior High. Okay. So while you were at North Miami Beach, did was there any professors or anything like that that stood out to you during your high school career that interest you in going to college or even pursuing a law degree? Uh, I was on the debate team. Uh, my debate coach, Merle Ellery, was probably the person that stood out the most. And I think... Uh, one, he just had a passion for speech and debate, and I liked doing it. And he gave up his weekends. We gave up our weekends. We did it. But he took, like, a vested interest in, in the students who were part of the team. And I think that's what motivated me. It's not, I don't think it's what motivated me to go to college. Um, but it's what pushed me. Because you're, we're competitive academic dorks, if there's, mm -hmm. if, <laughs> I, I think that's the best way to describe it. So you're competing against other people who are high achievers in an academic setting. So that translates to the classroom. What kind of topics is your debate? I was involved, it's called extemporaneous speaking. So I did uh, foreign extemp uh, predominantly. And what that entails is you'll get three random questions uh, about some global event. Um, and then what you'll have to do is answer that question. Um, let's see if I can think of one. I, I wouldn't even know one currently. Like, like it would be something, how does the center, 
Central American immigration crisis into Mexico impact the global economy? And then you'd have to answer that. And then you'd have to outline your reason. And the way it's set up is you would have 30 minutes to prepare your answer, which is a seven minute speech you then deliver. So that's what I ended up doing predominantly. Okay, so transitioning from high school, what undergrad institution did you go to? I went to University of Florida. And what made you decide to go to University of Florida? I wanted to go to University of Florida since I was seven years old. Um, not like, and the reason is very strange. It may, it may not be strange to other people. It may be the same experience a lot of people have. I didn't know anybody that went to college. It's not like it was a big part of my family just because we were not from the States. But an uncle of mine got his doctorate degree in one of the agricultural sciences and I was it was the summer between first and second grade for me and I remember my parents took me out of school we went up to the graduation it was the first time I went to a college campus and I I fell in love with the university and I became a Gator sports fan and I rooted for Florida since I was seven years old all the way through so my first choice in schools was UF I applied early uh, back then in 1999-2000 if you applied early, you couldn't apply anywhere else, but they, they let you know by like early, I want to say they, they let you know by October if you got in, because since you're not applying anywhere else, they wanted you to give you the option if you didn't get in to apply at other places. So I knew fairly early I got into UF, and that's the only school I applied to in undergrad. Okay, so first day of undergrad, what was it like? What was the process of moving in? Did you live on campus? I lived on campus. I lived Beatty Towers West. Um, I was shell-shocked. I think what a lot of people, at least from my perspective, don't realize if you're the first in your family to graduate and go to college is how little you know about what to expect. I just had no idea. I was, I was, I was, even though I was going to UF, I was going to college, I was very nervous. I was not looking forward to because I had no idea what to expect. I, I became accustomed to living at home, going to school, and that's it. I didn't, I didn't know what it would entail. I didn't really have anyone I was super close with that I could pick their brain about what college is like. And, like, my uncle's the only person I knew, and he's, when he was going to college, he was married to my aunt, so his experience is going to be completely different than mine. So I was, I was more nervous than anything. Um, my parents drove me up. Uh, I remember my mom crying as she, as she's pulling away. So that's the experience in terms of that first, like it was, I think it was Saturday or Sunday before Monday or Tuesday classes. I remember that sticking out. I was just, I was nervous more than anything else. That's the overwhelming feeling I had. And before I forget, what is your uncle's name? Uh, Serge Edme, I think S-E-R-G-E-E-D-M-E. -E -E. Him and my aunt are no longer together, but that's, that's the person who had the influence on me to go to UF. Yeah. Okay, so going back to, I just wanted to make yeah. sure we got his name. Yeah. Um, going back to Beatty Towers. So you get there, you're at Beatty Towers, and it's Monday. Mm -hmm. So what was your first class? What was what was the atmosphere like? Do you remember? I, it was, I took two classes that summer. One was a political science course. And I remember it was a lot, large auditorium classroom. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember. It's so far removed for me now. I can't remember <laughs> at this point. But I just remember just being there. And I. it's sort of the, do I want to be the kid that says a lot? Just because I knew a lot of stuff just from debate. Mm -hmm. Like, do I want to be the kid that knows? I remember a couple times he just whispered the answer underneath my breath and everyone turned around. It's like, why don't you say it? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just not going to say anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be that guy. But that was, that was my first day. And every day thereafter it became more of a routine. So I knew what to expect. Okay, so um, what was your degree track, and did you ever change your major? Or I like did. That? My degree track was, I came in as an economics major. I switched after uh, financial accounting, because I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and then I switched to political science. Okay, so you graduated with a degree in political yep. science, and that's it? Or did you have that, another? That was it. I graduated with a degree in political science. Okay, so um, as you were going through your, was, did you graduate in four years? Did you take three years? The four. Okay, um, during your four year stay at UF, was there any organization or any specific event that stood out to you in the undergrad? 
I was in speech and debate. That's primarily what I did in undergrad. That was my niche, and that's what I got into and stayed in through undergrad. Were there any professors or teachers that really stuck out to you? No, not really. Not in undergrad. I was sort of a blend-in kind of person in undergrad in terms of classes and everything else. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide to want to pursue a career in law? I took the long track of, for law school. I didn't want to practice law. I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this. Uh, so, uh, like, I did a little bit of everything. 2004, 2005, I was in Miami. I went back to live in Miami, and I was like a marketing rep for, like, some really small family. And this is weird. You know, like... Now no one has them, but there used to be like little trinkets you stuck on your phone. You were going to be, I don't know if you grew up in yeah. that era. There were like trinkets you stuck on your phone, you're stuck on your keys. And my job was to uh, obtain licensing rights for this small little company to reproduce uh, copywritten or intellectual property uh, versions of these little trinkets. So that's what I did for a year or two. And then a year, I moved to Orlando and I spent a couple of years. Uh, as a mortgage broker and I decided to pick the perfect time right when the housing market was collapsing and then ultimately when, at, at that point I had I'm like I've got to figure out what I'm going to do long term and I applied to law school here because I was living here with my girlfriend and fam, fam you gave me a full ride so my first year was at Florida A&M in 2008 2009 uh, and then I transferred to UF uh, after my first year. Okay, so starting at FAM, what was that experience like? Did you did you always want to have an HBCU experience, or was it not traditional? It, it wasn't. It wasn't. I wanted an HBCU experience. It's not something like it helped because there were two schools here. It's here. It's either FAM or Barry. Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason I went to FAM it was an HBCU, uh, but the other part is they gave me a full ride. And, and I couldn't pass that up. And Barry is like four times as much. Mm -hmm. So um, your classes at FAM, did you take the standard um, six classes or how was the structure? It was the exact same as UF. Um, the one thing FAM did offer, which I'm glad I took advantage of, is they had a supplemental course, which you didn't have to pay for, but you didn't get credit for, which is just an intensive writing course. Mm -hmm. So you had to fit it around your schedule as the middle of lunch. Um, so you'd have to give up your lunch a couple times a week. And I just remember that helped me as much as any course I took in law school. Because I always felt like I was like, eh, I was an average writer at best. But taking that course would you know, sort of hammered a lot of the fundamentals. I felt I became a better writer after that, which is something I still use most of my most of the time I'm writing more than anything else. Um, but the other courses were the same. We took con law, uh, contracts, crim law, all the same introductory first year courses. What was the student life like at FAMU Law? <sighs> uh, I'm trying to compare it to UF Law. It, it's different than UF Law because FAM was about 50-50. In terms of the breakdown of African American students and non African American students, um, I like the student life. I think a lot of, like, I just got along with the people there. Like, all of us were sorted in the same boat, so it just, just got along well. Did you have a sense of community at FAM Law? Yes. Yes, very much so. Very much so. And, and I guess the community wasn't defined by whether you're black or not, just because there were so many black people there. And from someone who went to a predominantly white institution for undergrad, like you would sort of, uh, I guess you'd sort of be attracted to the other African-American students and that's who you hung out with. Just cause, and usually there's only a handful of them, so mm -hmm. those are your friends. But fam was different. You got to sort of explore a little bit more while still having a co cohesive group of black friends. And they're just felt as more diverse group of black people the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I ask about sense of community is because when you were talking about your undergraduate experience, it kind of seemed like um, it was kind of a flyby type of thing. Yeah. Were you involved in any organizations or did any group call out to you when you were undergrad versus law school? No, uh, not really. Um, 
I, I honestly, it, I, I love UF, and I love going to undergrad at UF. I, I am a Gator through and through. But my undergrad experience, I was just there. Mm -hmm. I was just there. I was just there. Um, I don't know if it's the size or why, or like if, and if we're also being honest, I was just a much better student in law school. Okay. Like it meant more to me in law school. I had a hard time finding my center in undergrad just because it was the first time I was away from home. No idea what to expect. It was in hindsight, it, I should have taken advantage of like resources or anything else in undergrad. I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't. So I just sort of blended into that point. Would it have, like, was there anybody who tried to reach out to you or would it have helped if somebody kind of saw and tried to invest into you or would you have just pushed that away? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm hoping I wouldn't, um, but I also wasn't as mature as I was uh, when I started law school. Because like, in law school, I never pass on those opportunities if someone was reaching out to help. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I'm 17 or 18 when I started UF undergrad, if I'm mature enough to appreciate what someone is doing for me to take advantage of it. But I think there should be, especially with first generation college students, there should be more of an affirmative push to in integrate them into the school while helping them go through the process. Because it is an adjustment. You think you have it down and you just don't. You get sidetracked by a bunch of stuff that's not important you can't prioritize you can't time manage and all the things that you should be able to do but if you're not doing you just sort of get lost in the flow so um did i think it's called mfos so mockin florida opportunity scholar did that exist when you were there i do not know okay so um basically that's a program now for first generation undergraduate students and they try to get you where you think you want to go <laughs> Yeah, I think that that is something I, I did not know about that. That is something I would have liked to have known about if it did exist when I was an undergrad. Yeah, it probably didn't. So okay. It's very new. <laughs> Some people still don't understand about it. Um, did you hear about a program called PACT? I think it did exist when you were there. It was for um, black students to kind of have an orientation before the school started. No. Okay. Okay, so that's another program that yeah. they've started now. So I'm just trying to like find where we are yeah. temporally, but... Um, I, I think I identify with you when you say like I wish that there were things there that I knew about because mm -hmm. I think now what the problem is is non first generation students yeah. get here and we're like what is yeah. what's going on <laughs> so um, so when you came to Fam Law what made you want to transfer from FAMU to UF Law? Uh, it was a random set of circumstances. I was, I liked fam and I liked, and a lot of my really good friends are the people I met my first year. Uh, people who've been groomsmen in my wedding, I've been groomsmen in their wedding. Uh, bas like just the people you stay in touch with, like birth announcements, most, a lot of those folks are my first year friends from, from fam. Um, I didn't have any intentions of transferring when I started. It wasn't like, hey, my roadmap is I'm here for one year and I'm transferring. In fact, I, part of the reason I transferred to UF is because the application process was so simple. Uh, I was very frustrated with the administrative process at FAM. Um, it was a, I'm not going to curse, but it was a crap show mm -hmm. uh, in terms of getting my student aid on time and everything was just delayed. And part of it is... Back then, 08, 09, I don't think there was an appreciation that the law school was in Orlando, but they're still part of FAMU. So you're calling Tallahassee, and just nothing was done timely. I just got frustrated. And almost on a whim, like I know it was UF and FSU both had, and I can't remember, and I think UF had a later deadline and might have blown the FSU deadline to pass to apply, which is how little I thought about transferring. So I applied to UF and then. Like, I did really well uh, in my first year, so I got in. Uh, and uh, I still remember to this day, I got in into UF, and I still didn't know if I wanted to go. So I called, I actually called my mom and my dad, because they were living in Miami, and I was in Orlando. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And they were just simple. And they're like, which one's the better school? I'm like, UF is. Right. And they were like, that's your answer. Go to where the best is that you can go and everything will figure itself out. And I had that conversation. My mom told me, my dad told me, and I went. Did you have that conversation with anybody who worked at FAMU? No. 
Okay. And Actually, I did. I did. I had it with my con law professor, and he told me to go. He told me, he told me we're going to miss you. He was my con law professor and my moot court coach. He's like, we're going to miss you, but you've got to go. So you were on the moot court team at FAMU? Yes. And how did that work? Um, your second semester, so spring semester, they have like a school-wide moot court class. Uh, and so everyone's part of the moot court team and you have to present an, or an oral argument. Uh, it's usually on the weekends and you have to present your oral argument. I was pretty good at it. Um, and so the moot court coach asked me that summer if I wanted to be on the moot court team. There's the Florida Bar Convention was in town in Orlando that year. And there is the workers' comp moot court competition. So, I, yeah, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I went there um, to that moot court competition. And so that's the one I competed at. Actually, I think I competed against two members of the UF team. Okay. And at that point, I, knew, I think I knew I was transferring already. And so, because I talked to them like, hey, I missed, like I'm transferring. I think I've missed the deadline for a final four, for the McCor team. Like, what can I do? He's like, hey, I actually met the president. He's like, hey, send your, send your writing sample, your brief in, and I'll let them know it's coming. And then uh, I think I, I got in town in time for oral arguments, luckily. Okay. So, okay. So you finished your entire first year at FAMU. Yeah. Then you did, um, I can't even remember the name, Zamer. You did yeah. Zamer in Orlando. Yeah. And then you went to oral arguments at UF. Yeah. And that's your first experience being at UF? That is my first experience because it's before, if I, again, I could be wrong with the timeline, but I think it's before class start. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my first, first experience at UF is, and it was a quick turnaround, is I got up here and we had uh, transfer student orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was my first experience with the school. And then... After that, it was just getting ready for oral arguments. Okay. And how was that experience? How was the trial experience for oral arguments at UFL? It was fine. It was fine. I thought the problem was good. I was prepared. I thought it was fine. Was it student run? Yes. Even the judges? All the judges were members of the team. Okay. Um, so going into your first or your second year of law school, first year at UF, um, I have specific questions about the court. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll start there and then cut yeah. it on. Um, when you were on the moot court team, what was the racial demographics of the team? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to remember. Brittany was, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I was the only black person on the team. Because I, I know Brittany joined, but I think Brittany's a year younger than me. So she would have been the year after I, I joined. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I was the only black person on the team. Is that a historical trend from what you know? <sighs> there being like one, two, or three? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember. Like, I remember, I think it was Brittany and someone else um, when I was a 3L and she was a 2L. And I think Brandon White, the year after I graduated, because I still knew him. I think he was on the team. But I don't think there was any other app or any app or black people on the team or African Americans on the team. Yeah, it's usually maybe a couple. Did that make you feel ostracized or anything? <sighs> Not really, only because uh, when I did high school debate, um, most of the people I competed against were were white. Most of the people on the team were white. Um, when I did college debate, most were white. I had like two or three black people on the team. I was sort of used to it. Mm -hmm. Like, fam was the exception, where it was like this really eclectic blend of people from diverse backgrounds who were part of the moot court team. That was the exception. <laughs> that was not the norm for me uh, on these teams. So I, I wasn't really thrown off. And I think part of what helped uh, Rob Davis, who ended up being president uh, my 2L year, who I met when I was at the workers' comp competition, he was just super inviting. Like, he went out of his way to make sure I applied, and I tried to join the team. Um, so Rob Davis, what was his background? Was he, he was a 3L when you were? He was a 3L when I was a 2L. He was getting white guy from Ocala. <laughs> so he was Floridian. Yeah, he's Floridian. I'm actually still really good friends with them. Um, like I, like he lives in Winter Park. He works downtown. I think he's, uh, he's not a baker. I think he's at Hall of the Night now. Just a good guy. Like he, his wife, Good friends with my just 
I've known him for a while, just a good person. That's how I met him. And when you were on the Moot Court team, did they focus on specific issues or like specific competitions? How was how was the composition of the team and what competitions did y'all do? Um, I remember I was getting ready for Final Four uh, fall semester. So you were a Final Four member? Yeah. Okay. I was a Final Four member. Um, that was a cool experience. <laughs> Uh, and then I want to say spring semester, I asked them so I can compete in the balsam court. So I didn't, I don't think I competed with the team like 2L a year. Mm -hmm. I think I competed with the team 3L. I definitely competed with 3L a year. <sighs> like I know I did ABA. I'm trying, I want to say I did something else, but I may have just done ABA regionals, the nationals. Which is odd. Like I, like I, 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 I may have, that's, I think I only did ABA then. That, that sounds right. <laughs> that sounds very similar. Okay. Um, when you did the Balsa Moot Court, um, were they, were they, uh, was the Florida Moot Court team very supportive yeah. or? Because I told them I was I was going to do Balsa. Mm -hmm. Because I think they asked me to do there's a there's a tax Moot Court around the same time. I'm like I want to do Balsa. Mm -hmm. so I want to compete there. And so we did the Balsa Moot Court, which was in New Orleans. That year. Or was it LSU? I think it might have been LSU. We just ended up going down to New Orleans one of the nights. So. And how successful were you? Uh, frustratingly unsuccessful. Uh, I rarely, rarely say this, and I and I try to be as reasonable, and rational when it comes to outcomes. I definitely thought we did better than what our scores indicated. I thought we did fantastically well, and I thought we won every round we're on. And no, none of the judges agreed with us, and so it was what it was. But we. I competed with a couple of people who weren't on the Moot Court team, so mm -hmm. they had they had a good experience with it. And that was it. Oh <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, did you ever end up having a leadership position with Moot Court? Yes. Um, I think I was one of the intramural captains or intramural co-captains or something like that. And how was that experience? It was fine. It it was a good leadership position. I like I did well in moot court so I think everyone it's one of the, I think it's an egalitarian sort of organization if you're good you're good mm -hmm. and, and people sort of respect that um, like so I I did final four I won final four so I think that got me some respect even though I'm just a transfer kid because you never know how people view transfer kids mm -hmm. UF has a reputation. <laughs> so, uh, so I did final four. Uh, do you mind if I take this call? Mm -hmm. Do you mind pausing? It's my mom. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you're talking about the reputation um, UF has with treating its transfer students a little bit. Yeah, it may, maybe uh, I internalized it, but you just sort of feel like everyone's like, eh, uh, where you, you weren't good enough to get here the first time around. Like, I don't know. Maybe I've just internalized and no one expressly or outwardly said it so I kind of had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder mm -hmm. when I first started but after first semester I was fine um so when you got to UF um how were you able to kind of jump in and feel like you were included in the community at UF or how was that yeah because I don't want to I know it's Kim Thomas I'm 100% sorry but I just want to make sure uh Let's see. Give me one second. I'm mm -hmm. just looking to make sure I don't say her name incorrectly. Yeah, Kim. So I still remember to this day, um, which is different because it goes to the how few black students there are at UF. My first day, I'm going up the staircase next to the Chesterfield, whatever. Yeah. I'm going up the staircase, and Kim Thomas just, just like, hey, you're new. <laughs> I'm like, and she's like, uh, first day here. I'm like, yeah, I don't know how you know that. It's like, just because they're not that many black, not especially that many black males at that point. So she made me feel very invited and welcome. And she just talked to me. And I still remember that interaction. And everything after that was really good interaction with the black students at, at UF Law. And that became my favorite first community. I guess Moot Court was my first community, but that became sort of my really extended community at UF. So was Balsa formalized or did you kind of organically meet? 
It was formalized. We had formal meetings. Um, Brandon Sapp was president at that point, who also lives here, good friend of mine, also at my wedding. <laughs> um, so it, it was formalized. It was organized. Um, I, yeah, so it was, it was running. Okay. Um, were there any professors that stood out to you while you were at UF Law? It doesn't sound terrible. Not really. Um, I'm terrible with names. I engage with some of the professors. I'm a professor nun. I like, uh, but but nothing that stands out significantly. Like I, nothing crazy like that. Were you able to find mentorship? <sighs> yeah, through the other students, but it wasn't as formalized. Like you're my mentor. Um, there's all, I think it was a network of support more than mentorship, which is what I needed. And so, wait, you needed more of which? Network of support. And I had that. And it was on campus? It was on campus. Okay. Were there, were there networks that you could find off campus in case campus got to be too stressful or anything like that? Not that I was aware of and not anything I actively looked for. Okay, so you kind of just, when you were at UF, you kind of stayed on campus and that's where you made your community and your yeah. home? Yeah, yeah. Well, could you have considered it a home away from home? Like a home away from Miami while you were at UF Law? Yeah, at that point I was older, and you've got to remember I'm, this is 2009, 10, so I, so I'm older, I'm three to four years older than most of the students I've lived differently because I've had jobs before. Uh, so it, I didn't have a home anymore. It, I didn't have like, I was home away from home. Wherever I am at, at that point, is, is I view it as my home. So. And you say that you felt like you were three to four years older than most of the students. Does that still hold true for the black students or were they kind of the same age as you? No, I think most of the black students were, were younger than me. Most of them went straight from undergrad to to law school. Did they look to you for advice because you were older or? I don't think so. Well, it's a, it's a different dynamic because if they're my year, they would have been there last year and knew things I didn't know. Like I didn't know where, where I'm supposed to go. I didn't know where the rooms were. I didn't know who these professors were. I didn't. So a lot of that stuff I didn't know. So I don't think there was the, you're older than me, I'm going to look up to you. Um, have you heard the saying, the Gator Nation is everywhere? Yes. Was that a popular saying when you were in law school? I don't think so. Um, I because mean, you're living at the epicenter of Gator Nation, so you don't think about it. I, it's definitely something post-graduation, I feel, more than on campus itself. Uh, just because you'll be random places at a grocery store and someone sees your, my Gator license plate and they feel the need, like, some sort of kinship, like the go Gators. And so I feel that more now. Mm -hmm. Were you able to tap into the alumni networks when you were trying to look for a job after you graduated? Um, I, I'm a little different. I had a job by November of my 3L year. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the job I have now is the job offer I had. I, it was the, so I did do another competition. So that's true. Now I remember. Uh, I ended up doing uh, one of the Florida Bar Competitions, who, which again happened to be in Orlando between my 2L and 3L year while I was at UF. Because I was, I was externing Southern Legal Counsel down on 13. So I was externing there and taking a class or two. And then so I did the summer competition and my Moon Court partner for the summer competition, Brandon Huber, is a son-in-law of Ralph Martinez of McHugh Martinez, Dukes and Hall. And he saw me compete and asked me to apply because they had an opening for an associate position. So I applied and then got the job and accepted it before, I want to say early November. So I didn't have to tap into the alumni network for, for a job. Did you stay here from... Um, summer associate through or did you have a break in between or anything like that? I didn't do a summer associate here because I was still in classes. I started, my first day here was like early August after I graduated. Okay. 
So, but from from after you graduated till today, yep, you've always been. This here. is the only job I've had, and you like it. I like it. Uh, I would not have guessed I would have done medical malpractice uh, in law school, but I they extended me the offer. I took a med mal course. Um, my spring semester of 3L year, the professor was Randy Jenkins, um, who I didn't know from a hole in the wall at that point, but he turns out to be the one of the heads of university self-insurance program, which is the one that sort of manages all medical malpractice lawsuits against the university and Chan's, and he is a client of ours here, mm -hmm. so which I didn't know at the time. So it's one of those small universes where I know Randy as my professor, but then he became a client once I started working here. So, um, but I, I like this job. Uh, I, I will say, and I don't really have a refer reference point except for my friends who did big law. I will say if you're an African American student, you can find a small firm that respects you and thinks highly of you. I will always recommend you go there. Why is that? Because you don't get lost. Like you are, I am, I'm an important cog into this wheel. Because there's just not a lot of resource. We have nine attorneys, a bunch of cases, so everyone has to carry their load. So they invest in you to do well. Because it takes a lot for you to get to a point where you can where I'm at this point, I can manage my cases by myself. And so they've made that investment. They want you to stay. Um, and I know if, oh, my friends who go, who've done big law, they like it. I, I, I don't think they have that sort of bond with the place they work for. When you were at UF, did you feel like you were a part? Or did you feel like, if we're thinking about law firm and like we're thinking about UF as an institution, the law school, did you feel like you have felt like a big law firm or a small law firm? Small. I, as much as I felt disconnected from the university as an undergrad, I felt equally connected in law school. And how? In what ways? In every way. I, I, like I knew the people in the administrative office, like I would say hi to them. Like I, it, like I had a good group of friends, like I had a good group of black friends. Like it, it felt complete in, in law school. Was there something that the school did to make it feel that way, or was it just the people who you went to school with? Like, I don't want to discredit what the school did. I don't know. I, maybe they did, and I'm, they just didn't necessarily um, publicize it. it. It felt welcoming. Like, I felt it was helpful to have the transfer student orientation, because the dean of whoever is in charge of the transfer students, I remain in contact with her. If I ever needed anything, I can go to her. So it felt like someone was taking that affirmative step of saying like, hey, we care about you and how you do here, where I never felt that in undergrad, where in undergrad it's like, you're going to have to figure it out now. Uh, I felt in law school, someone actively is like, hey, we care about you. I think I got a couple follow-up emails to make sure I was transitioning okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so that helped. That made me feel as if I belonged and someone gave a damn. Um, and then, I don't know if it just happened to be the perfect two years. When I was there, it was just a good group. I just had a good group of friends through Moot Court and Balsa that I just clicked with. Like, I will tell you this much, there's like 90% of the kids there I don't know. <laughs> um, and I only know through reputation, but the friends I had were fantastic. Did you feel like it was competitive at all at UF or was it more, we're helping everybody succeed? I, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't in that circle where everyone was competing with each other. Um, like my group, everyone was sort of collaborative. And if we had something, we shared it with the others. And that's why I said, we, I, maybe it's just the group I had, but there was never that sense of competition. I'm going to hide anything from you. If everyone, anyone knew something, they shared it with everybody else. Um, the other thing with UF, which I don't think UF students understand this is, uh, I think the curve was a three, two which is a joke of a curve if you come from FAM where the curve is a 2-0. So half the students are above the curve and the other half are on academic probation. So there wasn't, in my mind, a 3-2 curve. It's like, what are you guys concerned about? Um, so I didn't feel like this overwhelming sense of pressure because I feel like I could roll out of bed and be okay. Uh, unlike FAM where it's like cutthroat to make sure you're doing well enough and not on academic probation or anything.
Were you ever um, connected through volunteer or pro bono organizations to the community in Gainesville? The only one would have been when, like I know Balls had a couple events, I can't remember them, nothing where I felt like overwhelmingly connected to the community. I know that summer externship, I was in, working in the community at that point when I did the externship, but a lot of the stuff they did, like I did at least, was a lot of legal research writing, and I think the case they were working on when I was there was uh, either an appeal or a challenge to a Tampa ordinance about the homeless. So. I don't think I necessarily connected to the community a great deal outside of the community that is the school. Um, is there anything about your experience at UF Law that you really, that has stuck with you, either positive, negative, or anything like that? Yes. Um, just because my background is a little different. Like, I didn't, like, my parents are very immigrant type of parents where they're very, like, books, everything, all books, all the time. Um, and like my circle friends were predominantly white. My circle friends in undergrad were predominantly white. Um, but the thing that stuck out in law school was it was the first time I had a circle of black friends who were actively trying to make sure we all succeeded. Like there was not the slightest amount of competition in my mind amongst my circle of black friends. And especially since there were like five black males my year, I think that, <laughs> that were there. So we all looked out for each other. Um, did that continue uh, after you, I don't know, have you stayed connected with the yes. school since you've graduated? Oh, uh, with the school? Yeah. Just through like giving and fundraising, mm -hmm. um, but not where I've been back on campus. Because the reason why I ask that is because I don't know if we could say the same, that that same spirit exists. Really? So I'm like, where could we find the disconnect? Because it sounds like there was never a disconnect. When you were there. I don't know, because here's the crazy part. So uh, Brandon, I told you, who's president of Balsam, my 2L a year, uh, Brandon Sapp, Brandon White, Solomon, who actually went to U, uh, to, went to FSU, but was at our school for one summer because I think he was doing some summer program with our school. Um, Farhad Lawrence, who graduated my year as well. Like the five of us ended up in Orlando and like we had, we made it like a black balsa male dinner every month or two where we just met up. Like, mm -hmm. unfortunately Solomon's moved to Atlanta, Brandon White's moved to Miami, but we still stay in touch, communicate via text much. Oh, and Jonathan Blocker, who was like a year or two ahead of me. Like we all just had dinner, we met, like we lived in Orlando, like we tried to stay connected. So I don't, so I don't know if it's the students who were actively making sure that worked. Because I don't know how the, I don't know why there is that disconnect, especially if, when there's only a handful of you and your, your success, I think is everyone's success within that small group. Or your students, like the students who you went to class with and yourself, were you highly involved on campus or were you just involved with Moot Court and that was it? And like go to Balsa meetings? Uh, Moot Court and Balsa, that was it for me. Uh, like I didn't feel like I needed anything else. Mm -hmm. Like I had those two and I, and I had school and that, that took up my time and I think that was an efficient use of my time. And then the people, um, the five or four other people that you just named, were they heavily involved or? Brandon was. Brandon was. Brandon was Mr. Everything. Um, Brandon Sapp, that is. Uh, what's the organization that's in charge of financing student-run organizations? It, oh, wow. It used to be Jumba, John no, Marshall Moore no. Association. He's in, he was president of whatever that organization is. Uh, student Leadership Council, something, whatever. It's changed. Uh, yeah. Now it's the Student Bar Association, um, but there was something before that. And I don't know yeah, he was whatever before that. He was, I think, president of that. He was president of Balsa, like I said, my uh, 2L year. So he was very, very active in like that aspect of the of the university or the law school. The others weren't. The others were like primarily through Balso and then their separate organization. They, each of them, I think, had like one organization and Balso, and Balso was sort of like the center for all of us. 
Were there any events that Balsa did that stood out to you? There are a couple of speaking events. Uh, like I know, I remember I received a scholarship from an alumni, uh, and I and I have the name on the tip of my tongue because uh, I his daughters he passed away. His daughters, one's in Tampa, who I saw. I know what scholarship yeah. you're talking about. I don't know the name though. Yeah, he was and a I, judge. Yeah, and I went to their golf tournament down in Boca like the year or two after I graduated. Uh, I remember that the daughters came to speak, and I thought that was a very impactful presentation. And I think it was just that. I think it was the student body, a sense of camaraderie with balls that stuck out. Nothing like, in particular, one event that stuck out more than the others. I think it hurt one of the, the daughter that lives in Tampa is Monica yes. Harris Williams or Williams Harris. Yes, yes. And it yes. was her dad. Um, but I cannot, I, as soon as I remember that name, I'm going to say. Is it Gerald it. Williams? No. I can't remember. I can't remember. I'll, I'll think look, about it. It's in my email. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know exactly what you're talking about, though. Um, so you graduated from UF Law. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, like, was it an easy transition from UF Law, the bar exam, to here? Or... I don't think, I think anyone that says it's easy is not being completely honest, but it wasn't overly difficult. I studied, I studied hard for the bar exam. Um, I was on campus and mm -hmm. one of the good things about being in court, you have access to the court office. So while everyone was super stressed out in the library, um, I was able to just go in the court office and sort of have free reign to get prepared for the bar exam. So that made it a little easy. So I didn't have to deal with the stress from other people influencing me. So I studied took the bar exam, uh, waiting for the results, I started working here. I think the most nerve wracking part, and you, things just sort of stick out in your mind as you get older, and I will never forget this, is when I found out I passed the bar exam. We had a trial here in Orange County. It was like a, like a four or five week medical malpractice trial, and I jumped in like two weeks in, and my job was basically just sit in the courtroom. I was just a gopher at that point. Um, and Brandon Huber, who is my McCord partner, who's the son-in-law, apparently texts Ralph, like, hey, bar results are out. And Ralph, at the desk, like, while this trial is going on, turns around, I was like, oh, bar results are out, check your phone. I'm like, <laughs> like, are you serious? And then it's not just our firm, it's like the four other MedMal firms. There's only a handful of firms that do MedMal are all in the courtroom. I'm like, really? This is just like my hand is shaking trying to find my name and see if I pass. So I remember that. Um, and then I started working and I was working here. The transition here wasn't too difficult. Uh, you just have to make yourself useful. And the one thing, like I said, the one class I told you about that legal writing course, I made myself useful. I'm a good writer, good researcher. I just am. Um, they started trusting me. They started trusting me with brief writing really early on. Like I would just handle the appeals. And I remember, I want to say it's either first or second year. It was a petition for writ of certiorari relief, where we argued. It was sort of a novel argument of what's a healthcare provider because if you don't do med mal law, it's kind of like it's this sort of Byzantine statutory system. We won't describe it as Byzantine. It is an, it is a statutory system that works, but in order to get the protection of the statutory system, you have to be a healthcare provider and the and you have to be providing medicine or medical care and treatment. The issue was it was a front desk receptionist who gave the test results to the plaintiff. And the issue is did they have to comply with the requirements of the Med Mal statute, which is a pre-suit screening, or is this just ordinary negligence? And there wasn't any case law directly on point, but it was my case I got to write the petition. Um, and, it, and I think ever since then, Tom Dukes saw my ability to write well. And so even cases that weren't mine, I started handling the appeals. And what you'll find out is appeals are time consuming. You, you're in the court, right? Appeals are time consuming. Uh, and it's different when you're in law school where it's like you have schoolwork, but you can dedicate a lot of time to it. Here, the partners, the shareholders, especially the shareholders, just don't have the time. Mm -hmm. So if you can be the person they can trust, which means they don't have to outsource it to a different firm, then you sort of, you're worth your weight at that point. And so that's, that's how I became valuable here and that became the transition. I'm not saying it was always easy. You have those moments. I remember talking to my friend, uh, Joe, who I went to fam with, 
And I remember I had one of those moments. I still remember I was, there's a apartment complex down the street on Central Paramount. I lived there, so it must have been my second year here. Like, I don't think these people trust me. They're not giving me enough work in terms of like actual tangible stuff. I think I'm going to look for something else. And he's like, ah, just stick it out. Let's see. And then within like three to four months, I was bombarded to work and I was barely staying afloat. <laughs> you know what you <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, um, your experience as a black attorney, um, uh, being in Orlando. So for example, I was born in Atlanta and my only experiences have been in Atlanta and Jacksonville. Um, being a black attorney in Orlando, are you, um, do you feel, do you feel like there are certain obstacles that have been placed in your way or is it more of just like, how would you explain your experience as a black attorney in Orlando? Um, if you're going to do med mal, get used to being the only black person in the room. Uh, I was the first, this is a firm that is over 50 years old when I started, I want to say. It was the first African American attorney they hired. Um, I don't think this firm placed obstacles in front of me. I, I will say, I think this firm has consistently said they believe in me and they view me as a long-term future of the firm. So I haven't had it here. Um, the places you'll receive it, this is Orlando's very good old boys. I think it's changing a little bit because uh, I think that generation is retiring, but they all know each other. They all know each other's dads. They all know, they all, they all know each other. Mm -hmm. And you've just got to be comfortable with that. And sometimes it works against you, but you just got to overcome it. But I think that's transition. You're getting a lot of younger judges and sort of like you're somebody's, somebody's your pappy doesn't matter as much anymore. I mm -hmm. think in the last few years, uh, just cause that generation is sort of retiring. Like I said, um, there aren't many overt obstacles that I've seen placed in front of me. You get the disrespect, and and sometimes you don't know if the disrespect's because you're young, because you're black, or because both. Um, so you get some of that. But the one good thing, and again, working in a small firm, working in a niche legal community, you know everyone. Like I pretty much knew every med mal defense attorney in the Central Florida area, just because they're five firms that do it. It's not something you just jump in and do. It's not, it's not like the plaintiff's side where there's so many plaintiff's attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, on the defense side, there just aren't that many firms because there are only a handful of insur ins uh, professional liability insurance carriers in Florida. And there are only a handful of them that give work to a handful of firms. So you all sort of know each other. So I don't think I've had a lot of those obstacles just because I've been fortunate enough to end up in a firm, even without a history of hiring black people, that's been really receptive. And I've been fortunate enough to work in a niche portion of the law where even though you're a bunch around a bunch of older white people, your interests are aligned with theirs most of the time. So they want you to do well and they're not gonna place obstacles in front of you not to do So, um, that was a lot, <laughs> um, like a lot in a good way. So when you look at kind of how you've gotten here, um, is there anything that you would like to encourage or say, um, to advise a student who is at UF law, who is thinking about practicing either in Orlando or, um, anywhere really, um, that you could give to your, that speaks to your experience or to something that they may experience? Yeah, I, I will say. Before you even leave UF Law, I will say find that, find your circle, find your circle of friends, and hopefully it works out. You guys all end up in the same city or near each other. Find that fellowship because that helps because there are moments of, you have moments where you're just not certain. Uh, you're not certain your abilities, you're not certain your future, you're just not certain. And in those moments of uncertainty, as much as UF will tell you, find an older attorney, find a partner to your firm, find a shareholder. That's not who you need to talk to. You need someone who will talk you off the ledge. Like, dude, you're smart, you're good, you've got this. It's going to work out. It'll be fine. And, and I've got that. And that helps. 
So that's the first thing. I'd say find that network of friends before you leave law school. And if you don't, if you don't have it yet, do everything you can to find it. And it doesn't have to be 30 people. It's five or six or seven people. You can always text who can be there for you. Um, the other thing I will say, be a good writer. Be the best writer you can be uh, before you leave school. Uh, no one likes to write. It's time consuming. It's annoying. So they will trust you to write before anything else. And if you can write, you will always be valuable to a firm. Uh, and that's coming from someone who does does move court where you want to make oral arguments all the time. You're just not going to. <laughs> um, insurance companies on my end will will trust you to write and they won't think twice. But I've only I've only argued in front of the district court of appeal twice. And I've handled maybe 15 appeals. And that's two more than anybody else I know from my year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but people will trust you to write because they'll have a chance to proofread it. And once you prove you can write, they'll trust you to do more stuff. So find a network of friendship, a network of a fellowship before you leave. Become the best writer you can before you leave. Um, and when you start your job, be comfortable with the fact that you're probably going to be one of only a couple of black people in your firm and try to make friends with those people. Um, it helps if you do just because you have an unspoken common experience. Um, and I think some people just like, I, I will say being one of the few black attorneys, you just kind of take a vested interest to make sure every black person succeeds, especially they're doing what you do. Like I know we had Chanel who, graduated like four years after me or five years after me from UF Law. She worked here. She's now at Rumberger. She worked here. But I took a vested interest in making sure this place was comfortable for her and for her to succeed. And I think for the most part, most black attorneys do that. Most black attorneys, especially in Central Florida, I don't know about the rest of Florida, in Central Florida take a vested interest in seeing other black people succeed. Uh, like our local black bar association, the Policy Perkins Bar Association, they have events left and right and mentorship programs but more importantly there's a sense of camaraderie it's a big organization mm -hmm. but you kind of find your niche in there um so in terms of post-graduation i would say find a find be comfortable with being one of the few black people whatever place you start if you're if someone takes you under their wing Take advantage of that. The other thing no one told me in law school is find some common ground with one of the shareholders or partners you work with. And it's not going to be the law. Uh, for example, Tom, who I'm very close with, our common ground is Gator football and Gator basketball. Every Monday we'll come in during the fall. He's like, all right. He, call, he calls everyone by their initials, WRV. What do you think? And so that's our common ground. And then that transitions into the practice because at that point we have a common relationship about football. And so it's not this tense supervisor, younger attorney. It's just sort of a better dynamic. Uh, with Ralph, I have the common ground. We're both from immigrant families. And so we always talk about that. So that's our common ground. Um, that's the other piece of advice because I think if you can find that with a shareholder, partner, or someone who supervises you, it makes the transition a lot easier. Okay. Um, so do you have any parting words that you would like to give or anything that you haven't said that is on your mind that you would like recorded? Yeah, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. One, you're good enough to do what you're doing. If you're at a firm, someone thought you were good enough to do it. And you've got to believe that in yourself sometimes. And it's not easy. And like I said, sometimes you question it, but you are, I think you are good enough uh, to be wherever you're at. Um, and two, just be the best attorney you can be. Like be the best attorney you can be. And it, it's, it's sort of trite, but like wake up every day and be the best attorney you can be. And I think my, like what I always say is I, every day, I want to say at the end of the day that I was four things. I was a good father, a good husband, uh, a good Christian, and a good attorney. 
So those are the four things that matter to me in my life right now. And so, like, every day just, like, maybe it's three things. Maybe you're not religious. Maybe you're not married. <laughs> maybe it's two things. But just be the best you can for those two days. And I think you'll be fine. And I think we have, at least from what I've seen, I am optimistic in terms of what I've seen amongst the black attorneys I'm with. I'm optimistic that the future is bright, at least in my small little Central Florida community. Okay. Well, thank you for those parting words, and thank you for your time today. And that concludes our interview.